Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in Surah An-Nisa he talks about the nushuz of women and that is I believe in verse 34, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 34 speaks about men being the maintainers of women and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, this is probably the most controversial verse in the Holy Quran these days, and those wives, the women, that you fear or you're concerned about them committing nushuz, we'll explain what nushuz is, the Quran prescribes three steps to fix this problem of nushuz, three instructions from the Quran, number one, wahjuruhunna fil madaja'. number two, wadribuhun, hit them, number three. And that's why this is called the wife beating verse, especially by those Islamophobes or those who are critical of uh, the Holy Quran. How do we understand a verse like this? A lot of people say God with all his might and all his rahmah and God is the legislator, he commands men to beat their wives, what kind of religion is this? Yes brother. I think you talked about this last year, the year before, I don't remember when, but isn't it they can't leave a bruise mark, something like that. We'll, we'll talk about the details, yes, we'll get, we'll get about the details. Let's just put some quick perspective about this verse to understand it. Marriage is a contract between the husband and a wife. Nobody can force you into this contract, that's why in the religion of Islam the consent of the wife is a condition for the marriage to be valid. If she's forced, Islam does not even recognize the validity of this marriage. It's a consensual contract. Okay, whenever you enter a contract with someone, you have to honor that contract. If you make a business contract, political contract, whatever it is, there are consequences. A legal contract comes with consequences. If one of the parties decides to not fulfill their side of the contract, their obligations, and they want to break that contract, aren't there consequences? In society, legally, you could be fined, you could go to jail for breaking contracts. So marriage is one of the most serious contracts in your life. Breaking that marital contract is a big violation, it's wrong, it's unjust and there must be consequences. Okay, the husband has his obligations, he has to provide financially for his wife, he has to spend on her, clothing, transportation, food, whatever it is, he has to give her the time that she needs, there are responsibilities that he has to honor. The wife also has marital responsibilities and one of the marital responsibilities is her making herself available physically to the husband for intimacy. He also of course has to honor that as well, but this is part of the contract. Okay, now let's say a wife for no reason breaks this contract and she says no, I'm not sleeping with my husband anymore. Well why? Are, do you have a medical concern? She has a medical excuse, that's fine, she has that right. What are, what's a medical concern? Let's say it's harmful for her, she's going through a medical condition, she cannot be intimate anymore, that's fine, that's to be respected. Or let's say, let's say her husband has AIDS. She says, I don't want to acquire AIDS or HIV or whatever it is, or he has a STD, I, I want to protect myself from that. That's a valid, legitimate excuse, okay. So assuming that's not the case, she has no medical excuse, it's not harmful to her and the husband is not abusive because remember if he's abusive or he falls short of his responsibilities and he decides to beat her or he decides to not spend on her, she no longer has to make herself available. If the husband, the next few months he says, I'm not spending on my wife anymore, let her go work. If he does that, she doesn't have to make herself available to him anymore. You broke the contract? I don't have to honor my side of the contract. You see, you see the idea here with the contract? Now if the husband is honoring his side, he's spending on her, he's not abusive, he's doing everything that a responsible man should do and she has no excuse. 
for not making herself available to the husband. She either wants to hurt him, hurt the relationship, or maybe she has an affair with someone, or she's interested in someone. See, no legitimate excuse. Maybe at work she's met someone and she's like, you know what, let me get rid of this husband. I don't want to ha- be intimate with him anymore. Well, why? Do you have a legitimate excuse? She doesn't have a legitimate excuse. Islam says this is a breach of contract. She's now gnashes from her side. She's breaching the contract. She's refusing to make herself available for the husband. This has consequences. Because see, when a wife makes does not make herself available to the husband, what are the consequences on the marriage? The marriage fails. Intimacy is very important to glue the marriage. Now when the husband is not, uh, you know, being, getting his fulfillment at home, what's naturally going to happen? He's going to look elsewhere for that intimacy and that destroys the marriage. He's going to enter into another relationship, right? That's naturally what happens. So if the wife has no excuse in not making herself available, to the husband. The Quran says we have a problem here. We need to solve this. So what do you do about this? The Quran prescribes three steps. Step number one, fa'aduhun. You, the husband, go give her advice, talk to her, see what's the matter with her. Something bugging you, something annoying you, let's fix it, let's work on it. And mo'idha in Arabic means nice words of advice, admonishment. Just talk to them, tell them, look, this is not okay. You're, this is taking a toll on the marriage. Let's fix this. Hopefully that should solve the situation. If the husband is polite, respectful, and if she really has an issue, a concern, a problem, he should fix it. So that's the first step. See the beauty of the Quran. So number one, فَعَضُهُنْ Give them advice, talk to them, try to solve it in a nice way. It didn't work. The woman is not being responsive. All those words of advice out the window she still refuses to make herself available to the husband. Okay, what do you do? Should you just let it go like that? Well, this is going to take a toll on the marriage. It's going to ruin the, remember it was a contract. She has to honor the contract. Nobody forced her to enter this contract. So she has to respect the terms of the contract if he's respecting the terms of the contract. It's not fair for him to respect his side, for her not to respect her side. It's not fair. So the Quran says as a second step, if the first step didn't work, some people advice doesn't work with them. Go on a strike. How? The Quran says to the men, show them that their behavior is unacceptable and that you will ignore them. Go sleep in a different room. Show them it's not okay for them to continue this behavior. So as an example, as an example, boycott them. If I want to use a word that gets the idea, boycott them. Put pressure on them that way. Yes. Um, I have a list of questions. Yes. It says fil mabajir. I've heard one scholar actually, because that was the understanding that I initially had too, which was just go sleep in a different room on the couch or something. He says, no, fil mabaja means no, you stay in the same bed, but you turn away from them. Yes, that, yes, scholars have mentioned both actually. Um, probably the hadith mentions both examples. So one, uh, one level of boycotting them is to turn away from them in the bed. Like for him to give his back to her, to, to let her know that he's upset, this is not okay, her behavior should not be tolerated like that, I will, let's, let's try to work this. So if she's just being rebellious, uh, one, the first level is turn your back, in the bed, yes. That's the first step. But another example scholars have given is that the next step after that is just to altogether go to a different room. Possibly both, because remember this comes in levels or examples. So the idea is, the idea is don't um, sleep next to them anymore. Either put some distance by putting your back or altogether go to a different room. So yes, scholars have mentioned that as well. Both examples are mentioned. Now if you see the linguistic meaning of wahjuruhunna fil madaja is ignore them or abandon them in bed. That's just the linguistic meaning. Well, what do you understand from that phrase? 
Why did Jerahum know would be like, you know, make hijrah? Well, hajarahu means he, um, you know, when, when you uh, get in a fight with, a, with your brother or somebody and then for three days you just stop talking to each other, what do you call that in English? Ignore. <laughs> other than ignore, do we have another term for it? Cold shoulder. Yeah, giving someone the cold shoulder, ignore. right? Ignore. In Arabic, they call this hajarahu. That's why the hadith says, مَنْ هَجَرَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمْ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَامْ فَلَيْسَ بِمُسْلِمْ The one who ignores his Muslim brother or boycotts him like that for three days and he doesn't talk to him anymore is not a true Muslim. Brother, brother no, 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 any other Muslim. أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمْ okay. Yeah, that means, uh, you know, being on bad terms with other Muslims is, is haram in Islamic law. What if that person was a uh, bad person? Yeah, if that person is harming you, of course protect yourself from their harm. But if it's a dispute over an issue, you've seen people, they get, they have a dispute, they start talking to each other, it's haram. So this is called hijr. Yes, the hijra comes from the root word because now you're leaving, abandoning your old place and going to a new place. It's, it's the same concept, but hijra means he boycotted him, he ignored him. Yes. I feel like I'm missing something. If the woman is acting like this to begin with and she doesn't want to be with him, why would she care if he turns his back on her and goes in another room? That's a good question. So basically the woman in this example, um, she is living with the husband, she's still living with him, but she's just not allowing her, she's not making herself physically available for him. But she's still sleeping in the same room with him but she does not, does not want physical intimacy. So when the Quran says do that, it's a way, it's, it's just a, an expression to say boycott her. And that's why scholars have mentioned go in a different room, do some other things. Because they don't take the verse literally, they're taking the spirit of the verse. And in Arabic, if you want to say, you know, um, ignore someone, stop talking to them, you know, just turn your back on them, basically. When you sleep, turn your back on someone, that means you're upset. Show them, show the wife that you really are upset, that this is important, right? So, by the way, there are multiple tafsirs of this verse. You know, uh, Brother Ali, you mentioned the other tafsir where a man is sensing that his wife is probably being intimate with someone else and uh, he detects her lack of interest in him because of that. So the Quran says, give them advice, warn them admonish them, if that doesn't work then stop being intimate with them, right? Turn your back in bed, that's another tafsir, it's not a common tafsir that the hadith supports, um, it's just a new understanding reading of the verse, but if you look at the hadith that explain this verse, that's not the tafsir they present, they present the, the first tafsir that we're talking about. So if somebody doesn't want to just look at hadith period, and then put on as the authentic source, then well, when someone examines a verse in the Holy Quran, because the Quran can have a number of interpretations, it's important to know which tafsir those who had authority gave us, right? So it's very important to know what the Prophet or the Imams commented on this verse. I cannot just take a verse like that and look, let's look at this linguistically and what it means. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah, the linguistic meaning helps us with the overall tafsir. Linguistic analysis of the Qur'an is beautiful, it makes you better appreciate the tafsir, but it cannot make you uh, create your own story of what's going on. It's, you have to, we would have to refer to the tafsir. Yes? Um, one question about this uh, second thing, which is uh, to stay away from them in the bed. Yeah, to like boycott them, yeah. Is it just a kind of punishment and warning to them, or can it also mean that it's not beneficial? for the marriage at this time, if this is what the relationship looks like, for you to even be close to each other at that time? Basically, it's a punishment for them. It's a punishment in the sense that you, the wife, now that you're not honoring the marital contract, there will be consequences. And the consequence is that I'll boycott you. Now, a lot of women under that pressure, you know, they, they might change their behavior. A lot of women will tell you, the worst thing is for my husband to ignore me right? <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> the worst thing is for my husband to ignore me. Uh, ignore, ignoring her like that for, for a prolonged period of time, 
for for some women for some women that is effective and you know they'll reconsider the violation of the marriage contract could it also be like okay put it on pause there could be other issues in the marriage i mean marriage isn't only about that but maybe the other things need to be fixed but like what other things i mean other, i don't know other factors in your life that could be affecting how close you are to each other i don't know i'm just asking like, like just not listening to her husband whenever i guess when he wants something or pushes something else like don't go outside at this particular point in time so you said referring to examples like anything else could you use that second reason as a boycotting mechanism due to the fact that she's not listening to you for the for those other wishes that you may have but I, I think from that standpoint now if you're being just or not you mean if you, the wife is making other don't go to the mall today okay so he tells her don't go to the mall today but she does that she does so then he should boycott her Okay, if he has a legitimate reason why, if he has a legitimate reason why he's preventing her from something or she's doing something inappropriate, then yes, you know, we can take the spirit of Quran that number one, advice, good words, talk to her. If that doesn't work, then apply pressure through boycotting, for instance, or through ignoring. Yes, of course, we can take the spirit of Quran and not just this fundamental problem in the marriage, but any other problem in marriage, it can be solved through this way, absolutely if one side is uh, doing something wrong. So I'm interested now like, to hear what the other problems could potentially be that you may be like. No, I meant like marriage as an institution that could be built on like what creates love, when the friendship between the husband and the wife and how... Yeah, but by him turning his back, what is that achieving? To, f to work on other areas like, of the well, marriage? I'm saying like if you have a problem in your marriage, it's not the right time for that. So like stay away from each other. No, 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 no tafsir supports that, yeah. And even if you consult like counselors, psychologically, physically, um, all counselors when they're doing marriage counseling, they definitely recommend the intimacy should be there. It always will um, speed up the recovery in other areas as well, definitely. Um, you, th there is rarely a case where a counselor would, you know, tell them, okay, stop being physically intimate with each other and work on other issues. It just makes it worse and makes them more cold towards each other, definitely. So th that's not a meaning scholars have understood from the Quran. So this is the second step. Now let's say this doesn't help either. She doesn't care. In fact, she's happy that she <laughs> he's turning his back on her, let's just say. Remember, you still need to save the marriage. So the Quran as a last resort says something that a lot of people find controversial. How is that second marriage? We'll talk about that. No, 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 we'll talk about that. Yes, yes, brother. See, the Quran gives us an example during that time that if there's a marriage marital problem, uh, go and bring uh, an arbitrator from her family, an arbitrator from your family as counselors who will work on the case. So yes, the idea of going to a counselor is mentioned in the Quran. But at the time, they didn't have counselors like we do today. The way to resolve these matters is to have someone from her family represent her, someone from his family representing them, and then they could work it out. But yes, the idea of going to a counselor is actually an idea that Islam recommends. Of course, a counselor who's aware of, of uh, our laws as well, not somebody who's going to take you the other way. Because there are some counselors who go by different standards. We have to sure, make sure it's a moral standard that's compatible with the religion of Islam. So the Quran says, وَضْرِبُوهُنْ What does this mean, وَضْرِبُوهُنْ? The word dharb in Arabic has many meanings, right? They call it the wife beating verse, but that's not fair because uh, beating in Arabic can, be, the word dharb can be used to refer to beating, but it has many meanings. One of the meanings of dharb is to travel. Really? Yes, Allah mentions in the Quran, إِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ When you strike the earth. Striking the earth in Arabic is another way of saying traveling. It's just an Arabic expression. Allah uses that. So Allah uses the word ضَرَبَ in the Quran to refer to traveling. That's one meaning, to travel. By the way, some people today, without evidence from hadith of course, they've taken this meaning and tried to enforce it on the Quran on this verse and say, if she's being unresponsive, rebellious, just go on a vacation, go on a honeymoon with her, travel. Yeah, travel with them. 
Some are saying it, but scholars have not really accepted it because uh, the, the flow doesn't help, the context doesn't help, and the tafsir doesn't help either. But it's an interesting idea. Right? Sounds good, huh? <laughs> go, go on vacation, travel, change the environment. So that's one meaning of dharb. Another meaning of dharb is to gently strike something. Have you seen someone doing tayammum? In fact, the hadith in describing tayammum says, hit the ground. Now, does it mean go beat the ground, do tayammum? No. Basically, you just take your hands and you gently strike the earth like that to do the tayammum. That's also dharb. That's one form of dharb. In Arabic, we call it dharb. Yes, and then beating someone is also dharb. So now you can't right off the bat take this meaning, uh, this uh, word in the Quran, dharb, and say, okay, the Quran is saying, go beat the, those women. No, that's unfair. We have to see what the Quran is suggesting here. And what the Quran uh, is trying to communicate. We have to go to the tafsir. That's why it's important now to go to the tafsir of Ahlul Bayt to see what the meaning of dharb is. So as a last way, as a last resort to save the marriage, the Quran tells the men, okay, hit them, strike them. How do we automatically rule out beating, like physical abuse? First of all, it doesn't help with the marriage. You beat someone, what, they're gonna love you? Unless the person is, I don't know, is, is, has psychological issues, they'd like to be beaten. They're sadistic or they're whatever. But it never, it usually doesn't help. <laughs> What's you have seen? WWF? <laughs> There's people out there from men or women, they, they like that, I forgot what but, but yeah, but that's... It's not common. It's, it's not unnatural. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's unnatural. In a natural marriage situation, beating the other person is not going to help. No. It's going to make them repel more, rebel more, and not be interested. So right off the bat, it doesn't make sense to say, okay, go and beat her. It's, it's not going to solve anything, right? So we, we, already we know that's not what the Quran means here. So let's go to hadith. What is the hadith suggesting? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt have given two examples with these conditions. Number one, if he wants to hit her, he hits her with a toothbrush. Siwak. Have you seen the old toothbrushes? What were they made of? Like the twig of a tree? Have you seen them? They're this big. The natural type of doing, uh, of brushing one teeth. The Imam says he'll hit her with that suwak. The second condition, when he is lifting his arm to hit her, his underarm should not show. So basically you have your arm to yourself and you, you go like that. See, like that, can you hit hard? If your underarm needs to be closed and you want to strike something, can you strike hard? Try it, can you? Yeah, if you raise your hand, you can hit someone hard. But if your underarm is closed, can you strike hard? Do your best, like how hard can you hit? You, you can, exactly, you can't. Because the momentum that you'll be hitting with is much lower. So the Imam says these are two conditions, right? He cannot raise his hand, it must, his underarm must be closed. That's how he would strike her. Well, the question is, what point does this serve? This type of hitting, what does it mean? Why is this effective back then in that society? Let's just understand the context of the verse as well. Any ideas how this would be effective? Well, like maybe it shows how frustrated the man is like that he had to re, um, resort to that third you know, option. That's a good idea. You're, you're on to a good point. One idea is that when the man uses this measure as a last resort. Remember, he's responsible, he's honoring his side of the contract, she has no excuse, he's given her advice, he's trying to boycott her, nothing has worked. Nothing has worked. As a last resort, the man in that society threatens the wife. It's a threat. That look, you're not, I'm not going to physically hurt you because you can't physically hurt her with these conditions, but this is serious. And this needs to be, this needs to stop. Look, you're, you're bringing to such a point where I have to do this. For a lot of women in that society, this was enough for them to change. 
and to honor their contract, to honor their side of the marriage. And so basically some scholars have even uh, uh, phrased it this way, it's a way to break the ice with her, that look you're being so silly, so unreasonable, خلاص, just stop, for God's sake just stop and that's just a, a symbolic way of conveying it. Because look, the reality is if a wife sees her husband carrying a toothbrush and doing like that, she's going to laugh. Let's be serious, she's going to laugh, right? Like, so it's a way to break the ice and just remind her of her silliness, that she's acting silly and this needs to stop. So it, it's just a symbolic expression. This is one analysis of scholars. <laughs> yes? Exactly, see that's the problem when it comes to translation, you cannot accurately translate the Quran without properly reading the context and the tafsir and knowing that each word has multiple meanings, so yes. Yeah that's a criticism, that's a criticism for them or they just take the apparent meaning of dharb, you know, beat, you know, one of the meanings of dharb is beat, it's a common meaning, it's not an uncommon meaning, so they may be, or they just probably took that from other Sunni tafsirs. Of course. It's very important how these verses are translated, definitely. I mean, that's the reason why they say, I mean, there aren't really any good English translations. Exactly, because, uh, but this is just one example. There are hundreds of examples in the Quran where the translators far, fall short of conveying the proper meaning of the word. Yes, brother. Let's say this verse was like acceptable to accept Sharia Arabia. I think today it's not an acceptable look back, back then because now I think it'll be turned in two different ways. Like, say your husband comes at you with like a toothbrush. You know, today's society. It's gonna look not look like weird. It's gonna be like we're in the middle of a very sensitive time. When something happens like that, they're gonna frame like frame it as abuse right away. So I don't think it's gonna work ever again. You know, ever like since that time period. Well, see, the scholars are saying that we need to take the spirit of the Quran and see how this was a problem and what steps the Quran recommends to solve the problem. So scholars today are saying take the spirit of the verse. If this method that we discussed is not going to solve the problem in our marriages today, well don't be literal with, with these steps. Find another way that's effective in terms of giving advice, in terms of boycotting them. And by the way, we have hadiths about that from the Prophet in which he tells us how to boycott them. The Prophet says if you're the financial uh, provider of the family and she's acting like that, give her less money. Put pressure on her financially less clothing, less money, less leg <laughs> less going to the mall, <laughs> less going to the mall, right? Going to the mall less. The Prophet says in one hadith attributed to him, see that's how you put pressure on them, to basically pressure them to change. You see this, this type? So even this is mentioned in the hadith by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. As-Saduq narrates this, he says from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, إِنِّي أَتَعَجَّبُ مِمَّنْ يَضْرِبُ إِمْرَأَتَهُ وَهُوَ بِالضَّرْبِ أَوْلَى The Prophet says, I am shocked or surprised at the one who hits his wife and he's the one who deserves the beating, not his wife. <laughs> Beautiful words from the Prophet. Then the Prophet says لا تضربوا نساءكم بالخشب فإن في القصاص Don't hit your wives with an object because then there's retribution. You hurt her, according to Islamic law, she can take you to court and she can hit you back or have someone hit you. So see, the Prophet is very clear that you don't have the right to physically be abusive with your wife. But if there is a problem and they're not honoring their marital obligations, pressure them however if you want to pressure them you want to like go like strike them if you want to strike them go on a strike how so deny them some of their luxuries that they have 
So give them less money, less food, less uh, you know, opportunities to go to the mall and buy clothes. <laughs> See, this is a very beautiful hadith from the Prophet that kind of explains the spirit of the verse. So to address the question or the objection that you raised, um, we have to take the spirit of the verse and see what's the most practical way to save the marriage and to let the woman know that, look, this is unacceptable. Question, how come the Quran doesn't allow her to hit him if he's not making himself available? How come the Quran didn't mention that scenario? First of all, it's very unlikely in societies for a woman to be able to hit the man. In fact, if she would threaten physical, at any type of physical violence, she would get beaten up by the husband. So that's not, that's not good advice that you give to the wife, right? Because it's not practical. It's, it really isn't practical. Even today, in most societies, there are some wives who beat their husbands, but it's pretty rare. Number two, it's rare for the husband to, my, to not make himself physically available to the wife. Yes. So the Quran, the Quran, uh, the Quran talks about this, this, the scenario that's more common. That other scenario, uh, there's probably one, one scenario that happened in history and that was with Prophet Yusuf salam, when uh, she invited him and he said no. It doesn't happen that often, right? Even in marriages. If, if there's someone failing that aspect, usually it was the wife who would not, who would refuse to make herself available physically, not the husband. It, it could happen, but it's unlikely, it's much less. So the Quran usually mentions the more common uh, case that would happen in a marriage. Now when it comes to nishus, this the beauty of the Quran is that it's saying when the wife is not fulfilling her responsibility, the man had the social and family authority to kind of threaten her and tell her stop and let's save the marriage. But if he falls short of his responsibilities, you know what the Quran prescribes? The Quran says the wife does not really have the power to keep the husband in check and to kind of threaten him to behave. She needs a higher power in society. Who? The community or the judges or the qadi or the arbitrators. If the husband is being negligent and what is the wife going to threaten him with? Financially, historically, he's the provider, right? Physically, he's stronger. So how, what kind of leverage does she have over him if he's the one who's failing his responsibility? So the, the most practical way is to resort to the community, get the other community members involved and threaten him to behave or take him to the judge, to the Islamic judge. He will force him. He's like, look, you're, you're making a violation, there will, there will be consequences. In fact, some scholars believe if the husband violates his terms of the contract and he does not honor it, he, he could be physically, uh, you know, hit with the, what do you call it? Whipped. He could be whipped in court. Yes. So if she can't whip him, she'll have the judge whip him. That's the idea. <laughs> Maybe he wants to be whipped. Is there an actual job whipping people in court? Is there what? No, I don't think so, no. Maybe in some societies there were whippers, I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's something that, that's similar that happens in Congress, right? What do you call it? The whip, yeah. Yeah, there are whippers in Congress. So, <laughs> and, and by the way, the Maraja are very clear that, you know, uh, he is allowed to implement this verse as a last resort, of course, following the proper steps. If there is any chance that this is going to make her change her behavior, but if he knows it's gonna be worse, then he doesn't have the right to do that. Number two, it should not be out of hatred and seeking revenge from her, that's haram. The third condition is that it should not leave any mark on her body. If her body becomes red or any type of mark, he has to give her the diya. He has to give her the monetary retribution and he committed a violation of God's law. So just, just keep that in mind as, as you know, uh, we try to better understand this verse. So any final thoughts before we conclude? D does this shed light on the verse and the conditions? Do you still find it 
not, not the verse problematic, the verses of Allah are not problematic, but still this interpretation is problematic. I think this is better understanding actually. Well, yeah, understanding. Because you can never uh, defend that, you know? It's to say, uh, it's the yeah, beat your wife, defend, right. But it, it's not the, uh, a way of the Rasul and Ahlul Bayt would do something. Exactly, like and always if you want to better understand the Quran, and this probably is more of a deterrent, mm -hmm. right? So people stick to their marital obligations. Is that look at the life of the Prophet and all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They had wives that created a lot of trouble, but never, not once, does even a la'if hadith, a weak hadith, indicate that the Prophet or the Imams hit any of their wives. So that in itself sheds light on the Quran. If you really want to know Quran, look at the practice of the Prophet too. Yeah, so the idea is not to uh, promote any physical violence. The idea is just sometimes when the wife is just acting silly, she's uh, failing to fulfill her obligations without an excuse. Remember, without any excuse, sometimes the man has to be a little bit tough to tell her this is unacceptable. That's the spirit of the verse. Yes, brother. Uh, did the Prophet or any of the Imams ever, like how you mentioned that hadith where they would you know, take away some of the resources from their wives, did they ever implement that with some of these problematic wives? Possibly, yes. Um, I cannot recall a specific source at this moment, but I will look into it, yes. In fact, in fact, uh, Bukhari narrates, not our sources, Bukhari narrates that when Aisha and Hafsa started to create all that trouble for the Prophet one month he abandoned them. So see, that's the second uh, part. Of, yeah, he did not take it to the third step where he would hit them, but the boycotting did happen. Bukhari narrates, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he went into the house of Aisha and he basically told her, shame on you. Look at what you're doing. People are even saying the Prophet is probably going to divorce you. You know what she told him? Bukhari, by the way. You know what? He said he wouldn't dare. No, no. She, she said something else. She told him, Omar, you want to object to me? Go start with your own daughter, Hafsa. Go talk to her. She's guilty of what I'm guilty of. Why are you lecturing me? Go lecture your own daughter. This is in where? Bukhari. I can show you the reference. So, yes, we have. The Prophet kind of uh, maybe boycotting them just to show the seriousness of the issue. Um, so th there are indications sometimes they would do that, but, but never it would reach to the point where they would hit their wives.